Great. Because <laughs> one of the things that protects us from cancer when our cells are divided enough yes. is that we lose the telomeres, and now this, that prevents cells from becoming cancerous, and that's our protection. So if you put it back on, you may have aging better, but now you have cancer. So that was a problem for Geron. Their whole premise was flawed, right? right. So what they do with it? It was brilliant, okay? So what they said was, okay, we want to, instead of activating telomerase and make them longer, we want to inhibit the process. We want to make them shorter because then we have anti-cancer drugs. So if you look at this company, they're talking both out of sides of their mouth. They're oh, saying, God. we're an anti-cancer company. Yeah. By inhibiting this, by activating it, we're an anti-aging company. Can they get away with both? And the answer is yes, because different tissues may have different responses at different times. And so there may be certain times when you want to promote the aging side, and then certain times you want to promote the anti-cancer side. And so you might have drugs that do both. Okay, for the people out there, there's so many people out there that, that are uh, stuck in the, I call it the uh, uh, sociological and the philosophical uh, murk of all of this uh, concept of, you know, of saving people's lives through uh, anti-aging drugs or through vitamins or what have you. It started a long time ago with that uh, the gentleman, uh, Dirk uh, Pearson and Susan Shaw, who came up with Life Extension back in the 80s, I think, and they said if you take all these different vitamins, you'll be just fine. And uh, it, and they said, well, if you come now, they say if it's a cocktail, it's just fine. And then the, they came up with things that now we've heard these new words like uh, resveratrol. Is that right? And all these other things are are these? How do these fit into this whole malaise of, of uh, understanding about aging and, and the cell division? So, Ron, the way that, that that I look at this basically is that if you do what your mother told you, and you eat your fruits and vegetables, and you exercise you're basically going to do much better than if you don't, all right? So we know this, all right? Now, one thing that humans are humans, okay? Vegetables may not taste good, exercise, you know, take some effort. And so can we have a pill that will replace that? And so that's what you, people start thinking about now. Can we have an antioxidant pill? Now look, look at this from a plant standpoint, okay? And go back in evolution, okay? Our atmosphere, this earth, did not have oxygen when we started on it. Really? Oxygen's a toxin, okay? Oxygen came as a waste product of plant metabolism. And it was a waste product so bad, it probably killed off 95% of all species that were alive a couple of billion years ago. Wow. It wiped it out the world. Wow. And what plants learned was they said, okay, I can make lots of energy if I make this oxygen as a waste product. Now, if I can protect myself somehow from this toxin with antioxidants, I can live. And so that's what plants have done. Plants have fantastic defenses, and they don't make these defenses for us. Blueberries aren't made to, you know, as antioxidants for us. They're made for the blueberry plant, so it can survive. <laughs> and so the, the thing with plants is that they learn the lesson early. We picked up some of those lessons, but if we simply eat the plants, we can take advantage of their protections. So they have some therapeutic value. So they have much therapeutic value. Okay, now, what are the compounds in there? And do we have to eat the whole broccoli to get the benefit, or can we take a pill? And there's been much interest in what was originally touted as an antioxidant, resveratrol, okay? But now it's been shown that this compound can activate the sirtuins. And this is a class of proteins that was well um, spoken of at the meeting. And these look like they're regulators of our metabolism. Uh -huh. And this is what I came from this meeting, okay? So go back to early human culture, all right? And what were we doing most of the time? Hunting, gathering. Yeah, because we were starving, okay? You know, that was the problem. Getting enough food was the issue, okay? And so we went between feast and famine. And, you know, at some point, maybe the plum trees all came to fruit, and you had stuff you could eat for about three days, and then they were gone. So the body had to figure out how to get nutrients into fat, because fat is the best kind of storage for energy, very quickly. And it devised a way of doing that, that basically was effective, but made lots of mistakes and created lots of reactive oxygen species that were bad. Unintended yeah. consequences. Yeah. The idea was, okay, it's so important that we get enough so we survive the winter. If we have a little damage, we'll try to fix it later. Right. So that's where the fast and sloppy mode, okay? Yeah. Now, 
when you're starving, it's different. When you're starving, there's no food coming in, right? You've got to last. You have to have all of your materials that will last until food comes again. And then you go in the slow and careful mode. And the slow and careful mode is, hey, there's not much to eat, so we don't have to go that fast. Uh, let's be really careful that we don't damage anything. All right? So what this meeting was coming to is, can we develop therapeutics that basically might fool our body so we can eat normally and then fool our body to being careful. Okay? So we have food like it's a feast, but we're telling our bodies, don't worry, okay, there's gonna be more later, okay? Let's go into the slow and steady. And that may be the hope for us, because if we can do that, okay, go into the slow and careful mode of energy metabolism, and that's what the sirtuins apparently regulate and resveratrol, and perhaps some of the compounds and vegetables are taking us into the slow and steady metabolism that will then allow us to survive better. One of the things that, that happen to, uh, happens to people all the time, every day of uh, our lives, is uh, they stop smoking. And uh, I happen to have that, hap uh, that event happen to me about three years ago. And my heart rate used to be at 110. And uh, I, you know, and that was my metabolism, basically 110, 120 uh, heartbeat all all day long. And then when I quit smoking, it went down to 68. And suddenly I realized that my metabolism had slowed down to the point where I, the same amount of food that I ate before, now was putting weight on me. Yep, yep. yep. Is it, so is this was this what we're talking about? Is this, this is this one one whole part of it? In that in aging, I mean. You know, several years ago, I realized I had gained 70 pounds since high school. Okay, and it was just a little bit at a time, but basically, that is a that's a story of our lives of the aging baby boomers. Okay, so there is a change in metabolism, and you know, if you're active, you can try to reverse that through exercise uh -huh. and diet. Okay, but there are therapeutics that may reverse that, and in fact, is that directly correlated with health? You know, we don't have the answers to these questions. But I thought what was so exciting about the meeting is that we could start sort of framing the questions in ways that might be useful. One of the so, issues that, one of the big issues that we were trying to get the answer to in the last meeting, we, we didn't, we were unsuccessful, but there's a, a, a thing, a word called aptosis, is that? Apoptosis. Apoptosis, and that what it is means the death of a cell. And, it, and it, it's like there's a certain length of time that that cell lives and then it just dies. Is that correct or not well, correct? Actually, there's two ways that cells die. Okay? okay. One is necrosis. Necrosis is what happens when basically a cell just sort of just um, um, is... Um, Alex, what's a good definition of necrosis? <laughs> it just dies. It dies. Well, uh, it basically, I guess, dies from... I guess the, the way to explain it, it dies from the outside. It could be engulfed, but basically that cell and the contents go spewing out. Apoptosis is called programmed cell death. That's a meaningful death, okay? And, for example, the reason that we have separate fingers and we don't have webbed hands is that in development, the cells that would have been between my fingers apoptose. And it's, it's a death from the inside. It's oh. planned. So the cell is like, we no longer need you out of here. And those mechanisms are very important. Those are built into your DNA? These, these mechanisms are built into our DNA. So apoptosis, we have a whole number of genes that are really just so that we can get rid of cells at the right time. And those vary per ethnic group, per uh, regional areas, per human beings? Certainly for human regional beings. areas. I'm not sure there are ethnic d differences, but certainly there are, are differences in, in regions. And so controlling apoptosis is very important because if you have cells that are no longer functioning well, Okay, so if you can get rid of them in apoptosis, you may have done very well. One of the things that was taken by you and the, that you mentioned at your uh, in our last meeting was you said, you know, we just need to defrag our, our, our bodies every day and we'll be fine. Would you go into some detail about that? Yeah. You know, I think the problem that we have is that our bodies are accumulating damage, spontaneous damage of DNA, RNA, protein, small molecules. Okay. And to the extent that we can get rid of that damage, we'll survive better. And we have lots of mechanisms that, are, that do it. We have the protein repair mechanisms that we've discovered. We have DNA repair mechanisms that have been known for a long time where enzymes travel up and down our DNA strands looking for damage, finding damage, and fixing it. This is it on, on, in an automated system within I mean, our bodies? It's a totally automated system. And we